Good morning. On behalf of the Heads Consortium Board of Directors, I would like to welcome you to our 2024 Best Practice Showcase to celebrate technology and innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Reina, and I will be um, presenting your speakers for today um, for the preferred sessions of this room. Before we begin, we request your support uh, to please change your mobile phone to silence to have, and to have your full attention so we can avoid any interruption that may come up. Um, this presentation will be in English as a reminder. And finally, our staff will pass the QR code to all the participants to complete the electronic evaluation for the session before you leave this room. You can also find the QR code on your name badge right here behind. And your feedback and recommendations are very important to us. Um, now we are ready to start the concurrent, the concurrent session is under the track speaker. <laughs> And the title of this presentation is AI Empowered Teaching, a Model for Gen AI Teaching Integration. And today's speaker is going to be Arturo Osuna from Terrence County College. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoy the presentation. I apologize for the confusion. I had an old version of the, um, of the schedule, and I was on it too, so I was like, sitting there in my other's session and, uh, and then someone's like, no, you have to come over here, you're doing it today, so I'm here, all right. And at some point, I'm gonna take a picture because um, when I was when I was accepted to do this session, I told my boss to do this session, and they didn't believe me, and when I say my boss, I mean my 10-year-old daughter <laughs> and so I want to get a picture with everyone so that we can show, hey, you know, Dad's actually in Puerto Rico and he's doing a session on generative AI because it's all I talk about at home and, and they're sort of sick of, of me time talking about it. And I'm sure you're probably sick of hearing about generative AI and how it's changing the world. I, what I hope uh, you get from this session is really some sort of, some, uh, sort of maybe a way of thinking about what, um, you know, I'll move a way of thinking about what integration could look like, right? From a teaching standpoint, uh, if you teach, uh, this may give you some insights on on um, what generative AI could look like for you. If you help teachers, this may provide a model for how you talk about generative AI integration with faculty, um, with instructors. And it's really sort of my thoughts, my thinking around um, all right, it's here, how do we use it? Uh, this session's not specific to student use of generative AI, so how are you gonna use it? It's more about how you as an educator are going to integrate the tool, are going to use it, and I'm gonna give you some, sort of some ways to, to think about it, and then some ways maybe, um, uh, some ways that I'm thinking about it as, as a, faculty member. So again, I am an instructional designer, but I also adjunct, I teach business courses for Tarrant County College. Um, so I'm always thinking about different ways of doing this uh, for integrating technology. So just an overview of the session. I, I like to start my sessions with assumptions and expectations, so we'll go through that. I'll talk a little bit about my context when it comes to AI. How did I, how did I get where I am now uh, with, the, with the use of the technology and then talk a little bit about benefits and limitations. I'm going to introduce uh, components of a model for AI integration, uh, and then talk a little bit about a different model in the context of, 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 um, of setting goals with this integration, and then I'll provide some examples, and then talk a little bit about some prompting guides that um, I'll give you access to so that you can kind of go on your journey as well. So I'd like to start these sessions with assumptions and expectations. I think we need to continue to be critical of any generative AI output, right? And what I mean by that is, um, you know, um, these are, for the most part, language models. They're not knowledge models, right? And so, um, you know, you, you've got to just continue to be um, critical uh, continue to evaluate the output. Uh, these models are much better and much more effective in knowledgeable hands. So um, 
it just goes without saying. Uh, so the other thing I think is um, Journey Survey AI is going to fundamentally change really how we design learning experiences. Um, and as I mentioned before, this session is really focused on you as either a facilitator of educator, someone who helps educators, or as an educator yourself, right? And so, um, you know, this is just something that I'm going into as an assumption for this session. When I talk about AI uh, in this session, I'm really talking about generative AI, and that could be generative text or generative images. Uh, you know, I know there's generative audio AI now, right? So. I sort of use the terms interchangeably. So I know there's other types of AI, machine learning, and all that other kind of stuff. But in this session, when I talk about AI, I'm really talking about generative AI. Um, you know, and again, this session is really about you, and um, and this is really one method, one approach to sort of think about integration. And so it, it, it may work for you, it may not. So I have a question, just you know. Um, you don't have to say eight years here, year, but how many of you have already implemented or used generative AI in learning design or in teaching or in those kinds of components? Is anyone? Okay, so a couple of you. Okay. How many of you have explored AI, but not maybe not necessarily for instructional design or any of those kinds of purposes? So a few. Okay. <clears throat> how many of you are just learning, interested? in AI, just in general, okay, okay, you, and then how many are interested but a little scared about well, what AI, a little scared, it's okay, yeah, yeah, no, a little scared about the potential impact, no, I understand. My entire campus is scared. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm so is mine, but no one else is. Yeah, so is mine, and, it's, and, and you know, and, and you, you get the camps that are just ignoring it, like it That's doesn't fine. exist, yeah. and then you get the camps that are like, what are we going to do, yeah. and like, you know, trying to yeah fire hose everything and we need a policy you know and, and exactly so I am in one of those because I'm the dean and so I get asked about what is your policy and your yeah. policy and so we have a policy so we kind of we have people who fit in all of wow so you y'all actually develop the policy we actually have our instructional design the innovative learning center and yeah. help us design the policy but it kind of gives freedom to the faculty so, members so we to have any of those. right. So our our administration sort of astutely, and I, I say this because it's it's very um, strategic. They um, our our uh, leadership basically said this is a faculty thing. <laughs> well, I yeah. Right. <laughs> and and that's an astute response. This is a faculty issue. So our faculty and I and I helped with this. Our faculty um, created guidance. You know, here are three or four different kinds of policy statements that you could use, but it's up to you, your level of involvement. Which is very similar. We are in the middle of developing a policy uh, for these matters, and it's very hard. Yeah. Because it's not supposed to be only just about the professor, it's about the learning community in general. Right? And obviously, it's changing every day, so how can we construct a policy? that can help students, professors, administration to use this kind of tool because I believe in it, right? Yeah. I use it, for example, I wrote three, the three objectives of my class and they prepare like an outline that can help me to organize all of the discussion for the class. So it's work. Well, how could we develop a policy when it is changing everything? Well, I think that's why I don't know that we're ready for a policy, right? Uh, I think, yeah, we I need think, a generative AI statement. I think it's a statement or guidance exactly. at this point, right? Mm -hmm. And well, and and also you you know, it's impossible at this point to, to determine whether a student's written or not written something, mm -hmm. and so it puts people puts you in an equal bind essentially, right? So yeah, a lot a lot of conversations happening, and that's great. That's good to know. So how did I get to this point, right? Like, how, how am I up here talking to you about generative AI? Uh, you know, what has sort of gotten me to this point? Uh, well, I mean, partly I'm naturally curious. So I'm, I'm someone who, uh, for whatever reason, decided to jump 
with two feet in to the generative AI pool. Uh, as soon as the technology came out, I really started sort of in, immersing myself and learning about all, kind of, all kinds of things, generative AI applies, right? So um, I also support faculty. You know, I'm a faculty member myself part-time, but I support faculty. My roles have, uh, over the past 16 or so years have been supporting faculty. And so I knew that this was gonna be an issue, right? And I knew that we needed to get up, as an institution needed to get ahead of it. And so I sort of took it upon myself to, um, to learn as much about it so that I could help others, right? Uh, our campus is also very supportive. Um, so I, I am part of the Connect campus, which is the online campus of, of my institution. And uh, we're we are seen as the innovative sort of hub of our institution. And then our department, the instructional design team, is viewed as the innovative hub of our institution. And then my role is actually specialized in innovation. So I'm viewed as the in innovative, or so the spear tip, essentially, of innovation for the innovation campus, right? So part of my role is to sort of seek these things out and learn about them. So that's sort of. Um, how I sort of found my way there. So in my in my experience, AI has really been really good at these things, right? Helping me brainstorm, uh, helping summarize uh, important things, right? If, if you've got this large body of text and you need it summarized, AI is amazing at that kind of thing. Uh, personally, it's been really good at helping me organize my thoughts. Sometimes I'm all over the place and, and I need structure when it comes to uh, what I'm doing. So for me, outlining concepts and structure, I like to apply, and you'll, you'll know from this session, I like to apply models to things. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm introducing two models in this session alone. So um, this helps me sort of apply models to, to the work that I'm doing. Uh, it's really good at, help, at helping build simulations or examples, uh, and, and, and that's one of the things I'll talk about in a little bit about how I'm using it. Uh, and it's really helping sort of learn, like evaluating learning materials or evaluating, you know, but perhaps um, um, self-evaluation of, of your own writing or your own your own uh, work. So things of that nature, right? So you can apply rubrics to the work that you're doing, and then have it evaluate you and and and. Um, and students or, or other people, individuals in that context. So these are these are things that AI certainly benefits, right? Let's talk a little bit about, about the limitations. First of all, AI is not culturally aware, right? The output that it produces doesn't take into account the nuances of the peoples and the culture. Uh, even if you're telling it to, it may, you, it, you know, it's and, and that's why, again, that these tools are more useful and knowledgeable hands because you have your experiences, you are potentially culturally aware, more culturally aware obviously than, than this tool uh, that works off of an algorithm. And so, um, it basically works with the general information of a culture, uh, that specific culture that you're talking about. And it's very westernized, right? Yeah. Especially the models that are in, that are in, in place today are they're very westernized uh, data sets. So, uh, the, the cultures, the, the way it speaks about culture is, is very westernized. And, and, and so the other thing is it's not pedagogically aware. And what I mean by that is it, it, when it's outputting things, it doesn't understand that you may be using these things to teach, right? And so again, uh, as professionals, as educators, you've got to sort of sift through that. Uh, what's most appropriate within the context of your learning environment? within the context of the learning experiences that you're creating, right? And so, um, you know, uh, this is a, a huge limitation of the tool, right? And I, to me, the, 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 the sort of the, the, the really the one that's really the, the most vital of, of its limitations is that it's, it's so confidently biased, right? It's, it's like amazingly Confident, amazingly uh, biased and amazingly incorrect. And it's so confident in its incorrectness, right? It has a, the tool has a, um, a grip of the language. And so it's convincing. Um, but again, you have to know better. You have to be knowledgeable. You have to understand when it's spewing complete nonsense and when it's actually spewing something that's useful. Um, um, and so, uh, this is a huge limitation and something that we'll be tackling 
uh, with student use, you know, as, as we move forward as educators. So I want to introduce this model um, now. Um, it's, a, it's called the Assure model. Now, for those of you who are in learning design, you may have heard of this framework because it's t traditionally used for like learning design. So it's another it's another model like Addy or some or, or those kinds of models, right? Um, I wanted to apply this model to the context <coughs> of your own integration um, because when you start talking about it from a student perspective, you can use the same model. Now, for your own integration, we're only going to use the first three steps. Now, I don't want you going back to your campuses and saying Arturo Suna from Tarrant County College introduced the ASS model for uh, Gen, Gen AI integration, right? This is the Assure model, but we're only using the first three steps. So I want to be very clear about that. And essentially, this model is a very, again, very well known. The, the six steps are analyze learners, state objectives, select methods, media or materials, utilize media materials that require learner participation, evaluate, and revise. And so when you start to think about this from a student use standpoint, you can, you can use the same model. All right. So again, for, for your use, we've got 10 minutes, folks. So for your use, I want you to think about it from this standpoint. Analyze learners, so what is your needs? Um, what should you be able to successfully accomplish? Uh, and then, what are some methods and tools, right? So really about understanding what you need is understanding your strengths, right? So what subject matter expertise do you bring to the, to the table, and how does that complement what you're trying to accomplish with generative AI tools. It also, uh, you also have to understand uh, your digital literacy or the faculty that you're working with. What is their digital literacy or their ability to navigate digital tools, right? Uh, a lot of folks are starting to call it this AI literacy, right? Which is just an offset or another aspect of digital literacy. But uh, as you're working with faculty or as you're thinking about your own integration, what, what can you do, what are you comfortable with, what are you not comfortable with. And then most importantly, what can you do now? You know, there may be things that you're kind of thinking about and maybe you need to do a little more sort of a professional development for, but what could you do now? The other thing I say is uh, try not to focus on your weaknesses, right? So you leverage your strengths and then you manage your weaknesses. And what I mean by that is, you know, You've got people on campus that can support you, right? So if you're not creative, you know, look, look to see what other educators are doing in your field um, and how they're integrating generative AI, and then and then sort of get get a starting point, right? If you're not digitally literate, there there's a whole slew of people on your campus that are probably literate and probably understand these tools, right? Seek them out; they will help you. They're probably very passionate about this stuff, and they'll they'll talk to you and help you. And then if you're fearful, right, start small, right? Use the tool for things that are not high stakes, right? And then work your way up. So I'm going to introduce another model from the standpoint of the, the second and the third. Uh, and I love this model. This is the SAMR model. Uh, when I first learned about this model, I called it the SAMR model. And then people were like, no, it's the SAMR model. But essentially what this does is it helps you have conversations about the level of engagement you want your you or your faculty uh, to, to uh, use this technology, right? So are, are you enhancing? In essence, are you enhancing or are you transforming, right? And it all depends on you, right? If you're comfortable, you might, you might dip your toe into the transformation file, right? Which is modification and redefinition. If, if you're not, then maybe it's a substitution. Maybe it's an augmentation, right? So what does that look like? And I will be providing these slides so for whatever reason awesome. you need them. You. Yes, I'll, I have my email at the end and I, I have cards, so if you need my card. So again, as you think about this, in what term would, would this play in your in your own personal integration, right? 
Is it is it an enhancement or is it transformation? And then that helps you determine your methods, right? What tools are most important for you? So for those of you who are thinking about this, like any professor at this point right now can do substitution if they wanted to. And here are some examples of substitution. Uh, any professor right now can replace exam questions with new, new generated questions. And they can do this very often and more frequently. And actually, I'm going to give you uh, a, a link to my prompting guide, which, which will show you how to do this, essentially. And it will tie it to learning outcomes. So you could say, write me 20 questions that uh, assess these learning outcomes. And it will write them. And you can say even what kinds or how many or whatever. And, what level you can even add loops taxonomy I need them at this level yeah. and then it'll write them for you so some of you may be doing this already but I've got a prompting guide that will show you exactly kind of how to do this right so right now any professor could replace their lecture examples or scenarios more frequently right I teach business courses small business courses so I always need relevant business uh, examples my students tend to own bakeries or nail salons or hair salons uh, so I always need those types of examples and I leverage this tool for that right I leverage this tool to give me those kinds of examples when I'm teaching a concept and I'll show you an example of that and then anyone can do feedback so we've got five minutes so I want to get through this um, I'm not going to show these these are essentially uh, different examples of how like a history professor or a physics professor or a marketing professor could use this tool. I want to get into the examples that I have created. So I teach this concept called the economics of one unit. Uh, it's not important for the context of this presentation to know what that means. Just know that my students struggle with this concept. So I needed new ways to sort of teach this concept. And it's a foundational concept for my course. And so if you, I was learning. So there is a chat link to this. Um, I'm happy to share it um, in another format. But essentially, what I've done is I've asked ChatGPT to, to write step-by-step -step instructions to teach this concept. And it's given me steps. And what I plan to do with those steps is to use that as, as uh, reformat it, and even might even ask ChatGPT to reformat it for me in, in sort of a, a more of an instructional video format. And then I will record the video using uh, this as a basis for the, teaching the concept so that it, you know, and it, it's given me sort of another way to think about teaching this concept. I've taught it in different ways and it doesn't seem to work, so this is maybe another way that I can use it. So again, that's more of a substitution. And so notice that it's giving me uh, the step by step. And it even gives me examples on the types of uh, small businesses that I've asked it to do. So it's giving me examples of like bakeries and things of that nature. One of the ways that I'm thinking about transforming the work that I do is I'm, I've created a bot for my course. And a, the bot, I've named it BizGPT. And currently, um, the marketplace, well, it's been delayed. I think they just released it and allowed us to, 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 to create and publish these. But what I've been doing with this bot is I've been training it on my concepts, on the things that I find important. And, um, and it's going to function as sort of a tutor for my students, right? You're using the, the plugins function, right? Uh, no, I'm, so I have a Plus account. Yeah, I have a Plus account yeah. as well. So, yes, yeah, so what I've done is I've created a bot using the Plus account. That they allow you to create bots. And I've started to train that bot on the concepts in my business course. And, um, and eventually what I want to do is I want to publish this and have my students be able to ask it questions and it's going to answer them based on the concepts that I find important and, and the concepts that I'm teaching in the class, right? So it's not just going to answer their questions based on whatever it finds on the web, it's going to answer them. So I'm currently training this, this tool to be my sort of my online 24-7 tutor. The cool thing about this is I've also trained it not to, not to and not to do the work for students. So when I put this in my course it, and they ask it to write them a business plan, it won't write them the business plan. You know, so here's here's me asking it to calculate the economics of one unit. It's doing that. It's giving them the, the step by steps. And then 
And here's me asking it to write a business plan for a small bakery. And notice how it says, creating a business plan involves several key components. It's not going to do it for you folks, right? So at the very least, I'm modeling how this tool can be used. And I'm doing it in a way that's ethical so that I'm not just sending students out to ChatGPT and having them do it on their own. This is actually going to give me a way to produce and have them uh, have them have another way for them to interact with the content, right? To me, I consider this like student content interaction uh, component. So this is the way I'm sort of thinking about how this is going to transform the work that I'm doing as an educator. So here is, and again, I apologize, I don't know why it's so fuzzy, but I have a couple prompting guides. This is what's called a general AI prompting guide. So this is for if you've never prompted before. Like this is the elements of a prompt, essentially designing prompts and what, what those elements are. Very basic, four elements to a prompt. Uh, and and these are all um, these are all Creative Commons, so you know feel free to take them and do with them. And then this one is the AI prompting guide for online course design. And so uh, again, uh, this one is more about learning design. So it'll help you write outcomes. It'll help you create rubrics. There's all kinds of stuff in this one. Uh, it'll help you identify alignment, which is pretty crazy. So um, I've done a, a bunch of work on this, uh, on this prompt, prompting guide. So this is my information. This you can take a picture of. And if you want a copy of this presentation, I'll be happy to provide it. I apologize again for the confusion. Uh, and I appreciate you uh, attending the session. I do want to take a picture, if that's OK. We, can do we still have the q and Oh, excellent. If you have a second, can you go back to the last slide? I can. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Is it coming up? Yeah. It is? Yeah, it is. All right. Awesome. All right, I'm going to get right here in the corner, and I'm just going to. I get to get Richard. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Let's do it. My daughter will be so excited. Bing, you can get for free, right? So as long as you're using Bing 
and um, and the Microsoft uh, browser, you can use 4.03. Uh, uh, it's just part of their search engine, the Bing search engine, uh, is essentially GPT-4. So that those are the ones I use the most. I'm really interested, just because I'm sort of a social scientist and I'm going to be doing research, I'm really interested in a tool called Elicit that uh, you, you essentially have it craft research questions and it will help you find the research that will help you answer those questions. So, uh, and you can tie it to Zotero. So let's say you find the research and you have it in Zotero, you could, you could analyze, have it analyze your research question based on the research that you've identified that's important, which is a game changer for doctoral students. So um, I think it's, it's an important uh, tool. Any other questions? Christina Irizarry from Eastern Connecticut State University. Um, so I know at the beginning you mentioned that your institution also was like on the fence of how to approach AI. So what advice do you give to us, an audience that may have similar fears on campus of like, Plagiarism, we need a policy, we need this, we need that, instead of like actually embracing the new technology and how to embed it. So, so here's what I would say to any, so I, I, one of the other things that I do is I, I run our open educational resources um, work, and what I would say is that's innovative as well, right? Or at the very least, it's new to an institution. So a lot of, the, a lot of my focus has been on sort of behavioral, institutional behaviors. Uh, and so what I would say is you're always better off when a new technology or a new initiative can marry itself to the legitimized behaviors of the institution, right? So what, is, what, what, are, what are legitimized things that happen at the institution? And then how can, I li how can we marry the two? So for OER, for, for, for us, uh, Stipends are very important. A lot of OER institutions, they use uh, grants. But we pay stipends. The faculty know what those are. So we made our grant program in the form of stipends. So I would, I would sort of start to think about what is your, what is your institution actually value? What is, and, and what do the faculty actually value? Right, from, from that standpoint. What are behaviors that are already in place? And then how do you marry generative AI to those behaviors. So I wouldn't, I, personally, strategically, I would be approaching it within the same institutions that are already built. So if there's already a faculty association, I would be trying to have these conversations as part of the faculty association. Because those are legitimate institutions of the, of, of, of the, of the university or the college. So for me, I would be trying to advance those uh, within Departmental meetings, those are already established. I wouldn't be creating new things. Does that feel straight? I would be incorporating into what, where the institution already has conversations. So I mean, I think for me that would be the, the, the biggest thing, is look at what people already accept as true and as legitimate, and then tie in these concepts and, and this approach to those things. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Milton Santiago. I'm the interim president of Brown Community College, part of the City University of New York. Okay. How does what you do uh, prevent students from plagiarizing? Well, that's a great question. So um, I think we're going to have, as educators, we're going to have to have serious conversations about what that means. Right? Um, there's going to probably, I mean, you know, every institution is going to be different. But I think there's probably going to be some sort of redefinition from the standpoint of, because a lot of the work that I do and a lot of the way I, I think this tool is valuable um, probably is in the gray area of plagiarism. Right? But if this tool is used effectively, and use in a way and leverage in a way that will help students learn. It, it will be modeled in the right ways. 
uh, ultimately it will um, it will make students better writers from the standpoint that is that they're going to just writing is going to look differently, and not just writing. And we're talking about music. And but, we're, but you know, before you get into the see, one sure. of the things that you said that, that caught my attention was that this is not going to write the business plan for the school. Correct. So so that's to me right there. That's an anti-plagiarism. Uh, feature because I live in a world that we're in today, which these rules have not been redefined. So I have to. I get that. Yeah, but Th that's why. So yeah, you know I mean, so how does that? How how can that be replicated into other subject matters, right? So that uh, the uh, the tool doesn't do the work. For well, the ultimately, we teach the students how to use it in ways that are that are. Um, Ethical, ethical and but we have to redefine that. I think it's going to involve a redefinition of what ethical is. Just the same way that we did with uh, using calculators, right? Or graphing calculators. We'll have to redefine what that looks like, right? And it'll be different for every discipline and every institution. Yeah, absolutely. Any other? Oh, are we done? So I'm here. I love to have conversations about this. I'm naturally shy, so I may not come up to you. But <laughs> if you're not naturally shy, come up to me and let's talk. I'd love to have a conversation about this. All right. Thank you so much for your participation in this session. Um, we invite you to participate in any of the other sessions we will have today going on. Um, remember to um, do the evaluation for each session. My peer will be handing out of the QR code for it. It's very important for us. Um, remember, we have, you can log in into Hedge.org, and, and you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram so, you, so that you can be uh, up to date with any activities that we will be hosting. Uh, next semester, we are also going to have the Heads of Learning Technology and Leadership Academy, which is a professional development program focused on developing the next generation of leaders in order to promote and facilitate the adoption of teaching and learning technologies. Thank you so much.